patterns clearly so they have a monoclinic uh, structure and uh, which is again confirmed from Raman uh, results. So these are pure copper oxide uh, monoclinic uh, structured uh, uh, morphologies uh, where we have uh, controlled the crystallite size from varying from 10 to 12 nanometers. So crystallite size variation is minimal. It's the morphology which is, we have uh, controlled by optimizing the experimental conditions. Again, we have pushed these materials and to test their photocatalytic performance for an array of pollutants, including methylene blue, methyl orange, malachite green, 4-nitrophenol, various sort of organic pollutants and some toxic chemicals to test their photocatalytic effic efficacy. So what we see here is that among all these synthesized uh, morphologies of copper oxide, uh, nano uh, flowers, copper oxide flower-like morphology shows the highest, or what you call, the, they are the most efficient photocatalyst as compared with other two morphologies, even though they have reasonably strong photocatalytic activity. So, so this appeared uh, uh, recently in catalysis letters. So this is for methyl orange dye. This is another organic pollutant which is predominantly used in dyes uh, in various industries, particularly textile industries, and uh, uh, wherever we need some sort of uh, these uh, dyes. And uh, again, for this uh, uh, methyl orange degradation, uh, flowers of copper oxide are has, exhibit the highest photocatalytic activity. Now, these are few representative organic pollutants we wanted to test on various nitroaromatic compounds. We chose four nitrophenol is one of the major uh, pollutants in uh, wastewater. And uh, we wanted to see that uh, what, uh, what is the activity, catalytic activity of various nanostructures of copper oxide. And uh, for this, this UV visible spectra clearly shows that copper oxide fl uh, flowers, they efficiently reduce Four nitrophenol to four aminophenol in just four minutes. It's, it's important to note that while four nitrophenol is extremely toxic, four aminophenol is very useful. It finds a lot of applications in pharmaceuticals, and that's where it is, becomes important to convert uh, this toxic chemical in water to a very useful form, which is non-toxic and usable. And again, in this case, you can see that zinc oxide, uh, this copper oxide uh, catalyst, uh, particularly flowers and cabbages, they have very strong uh, catalytic activity. Flowers have the highest uh, catalytic activity. You can see that uh, these red constants are very high uh, for, as compared to cabbages and nano seeds. So these flowers and cabbages are extremely good catalysts with flowers of copper oxide leading from the plant. So I must mention that uh, as compared to other reported uh, work catalysts uh, based on copper oxide, these are extremely efficient one. Uh, they beat a, a major chunk of uh, the catalysts in use and such efficient and inexpensive catalysts are uh, the need of the hour for converting this uh, waste water uh, into some sort of a usable water and uh, uh, extract something which is valuable like uh, this sort of uh, useful for nitrophenol from that. But uh, in that context, what we see here is that you have morphology dependent uh, photocatalytic and catalytic activity shown by copper oxide nanostructures. The surface area measured through PET analysis uh, shows that uh, uh, flowers have higher, uh, highest uh, uh, surface area of 52.64 meters per gram, followed by cabbages and nanocytes. Now, uh, this surface area particularly is going to be important for catalysis because uh, uh, this uh, number of active sites and surface will play critical role in adsorption of this pollutant molecules. And uh, this adsorption process is going to have a say. And of course, this will help uh, efficient uh, detoxification of wa uh, wastewater. And uh, so, so morphologies, uh, if you see, the flower-like morphologies have the highest efficiency for degrading um, methylene blue, methyl orange, four nitrophenol. So they are the best ones among the, all the copper oxide uh, nanostructures 
synthesize in my group. Now, uh, so this uh, various powdered nano uh, catalysts have been in use. One of the major bottlenecks uh, for large scale purification is that it's recovery. You want, we, I mean, you have to use this for multiple times, otherwise the cost factor goes up. So when you want a large scale viable process, one has to ensure that you have a reusability so that it can be used multiple times without loss in its catalytic and photocatalytic activity. And of course, cost effectiveness has to go when you go even for a very uh, green energy, what you call large scale solar driven water purification systems uh, that has to be taken into consideration. Now, it, it advanced photocatalysts uh, can be made up of uh, uh, thin film forms where you can uh, take out these uh, uh, coated uh, samples from any system with ease. So when, as far as reusability is concerned, thin films or coatings of various advanced uh, uh, catalysts and photocatalysts is going to be important and is extremely needed at this hour. So considering that in, uh, we have developed an array of nanostructured metal oxide coatings by various physical and chemical groups. So this is a representative work on nanostructure TiO to thin film coatings on various substrates. These are, in this case, we have used uh, uh, glass, silica glass and uh, silicon and other substrate also it's feasible by RF uh, magnetron sputtering. This work came in uh, 2017. And uh, so you see this, we take any substrate, now you coat nanostructure TiO thin film by magnetron, RF magnetron sputtering. Atomic force microscopy uh, was carried out. You can see the AFM images clearly show that they are nanostructure coatings. And of course, there is a change in the size uh, of these nanostructures in this thin film. Now, if you look at this optical absorption and uh, Raman spectra, again, uh, we have, we accordingly find out that uh, uh, from Raman, that of course they are made up of uh, uh, TiO2, that's NRTS TiO2. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, so we have synthesized different thicknesses. Now, TiO2 thin films of four different thicknesses, 20, 40, 80, and 100 nanometer. We want to test that whether the Thickness as I say, when you, because you cannot go on coating uh, micron thick films uh, in with the hope of developing an extremely good photocatalyst or catalyst. So, so that's where optimization of this thickness is going to be another uh, issue for us to be addressed when you want to develop this sort of efficient coatings. So, and one can see the size of these uh, nanostructures uh, decreases from 52 to 10 nanometer as we keep on increasing this. Uh, um, thickness of the film from 20 to 100 nanometer. The surface softness varies from 4.1 to 0.7 nanometer. And of course, the band gap variations are seen from 3.4 uh, uh, to 2.8 uh, electron volt. And you can see that surprisingly, 40 nanometer thick films has the lowest band gap. And these coatings are tested for various uh, pollutant degradation driven by sunlight. And uh, we see that uh, thickness does have a say in deciding the photocatalytic activity and 40 nanometer thick TiO2 film, which is a uh, uh, thin film coating, um, is going to be the most, is the most photocat efficient photocatalyst and integrates 83% uh, of this uh, methylene blue in only 45 minutes. Now you must consider here as you are looking at a very thin film, 40 nanometer thin film, or a small area, if you put around one centimeter by one centimeter, it is a scalable thing. One can go for a large area coatings, and uh, that's where the no, amount of photocatalyst involved is very small. Even then, it degrades a good amount of uh, a pollutant in no time, so that's exciting. So that means development of coatings, uh, large area coatings using sputtering is an alternative for uh, developing advanced photocatalytic coatings for specific purposes where you want to uh, exploit this photocatalytic capability for uh, our advantage. Again, we have synthesized uh, nanostructure copper oxide thin film coatings by DC ma uh, magnetron sputtering. So this is reactive DC sputtering. 
So what we have done here, you have uh, taken uh, pure uh, copper disc, 99.99% uh, pure, and then as uh, a sputtering target, and we have uh, prepared uh, various uh, 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 films on different substrates, and silica glass substrates are used because it is inexpensive, and you can sort of use it. And uh, this process is viable for any uh, most of the surfaces which can withstand uh, temperatures raising up to 300 degrees centigrade, because that's what we have uh, used uh, for substrate temperature variations. So we have synthesized different film films, coatings at uh, 40 degree, 100 degree, and 300 degree centigrade, and they are named as uh, respectively D1, D2, and D3. So what happens here in this sort of a process is that uh, uh, when you spot her, uh, we have a deposition of copper and oxygen atoms onto the substrate. Diffusion of these uh, atoms leads to the nucleation of copper oxide nanoparticles, which grow, and uh, further uh, continual bombardment of this uh, thin film coating, growing thin film, results in formation of needle type anisotropic structures at different temperatures. So the FESC images clearly show these coatings are made up of some needle type structures of copper oxide. Uh, so these are monoclinic CO, uh, which is confirmed from XRD. And the average size of these structures varies from 15 to 8 nanometer. Surface roughness uh, is, in, is found to increase from 4.2 to 6.0 nanometer. So we have developed nanostructured copper oxide uh, coating on silica glass substrates. And you can see that the substrate temperature has a say in deciding the, uh, the uh, particle size and, of course, the surface roughness of the coatings. XRD clearly shows that it's a monoclinic copper oxide, and uh, optical absorption shows that D3 has the highest absorbance that it can efficiently utilize this uh, radiation or radiation in this region. And uh, the average crystallite size varies from 16 to 7 nanometer as we increase the temperature, substrate temperature from 40 to 300 degrees centigrade. These coatings again were tested uh, for their catalytic, uh, photocatalytic and catalytic activity against uh, different organic pollutants and uh, uh, some toxic chemicals. And we are represent some few uh, of these results where you so see that uh, D3, that is the sample which is prepared at uh, 300 degree, both 100 degree uh, temperature uh, sample per 100 degree as well as 300 degree, so higher efficiency with uh, this uh, CO film, which is prepared at 300 degree, exhibiting the um, superior photocatalytic activity than other samples. So that means the substrate temperature, the crystallite size is going to be decisive when you want to control the catalytic or photocatalytic activity of this sample. So for considering copper oxide, uh, for copper oxide thin films, these are a very high photocatalytic uh, uh, sort of efficiency. And looking at the red constant, they're very high than the earlier reported values. This work came in uh, Ceramic International uh, recently. And again, uh, for this, uh, the, uh, another uh, pollutant, uh, methyl orange, it's the uh, sample which you have prepared at 300 degrees centigrade is the best photocatalyst. And uh, uh, also it has, uh, uh, this followed by 100 degree uh, sample that are prepared at 100 degree. And of course, uh, so you can, now you can see that substrate temperature during this sort of a, a sputter deposition uh, controls the morphology, controls the crystallite size and, uh, uh, and rough surface roughness of the films. And the surface roughness of the films obviously increases the uh, uh, surface area or the what you call number of adsorption sites, active adsorption sites, facilitating um, their all, uh, subsequent degradation. We have tested these uh, uh, coatings, copper oxide coatings, for uh, catalytic reduction of 4-nitrophenol in water. And this uh, UV visible spectra clearly shows that it just takes 15 minutes to almost clear, completely convert Four nitrophenol into four aminophenol, and this uh, sample D3, which is prepared at copper oxide film prepared at 300 degree centigrade, exhibits higher catalytic activity. This uh, superior catalytic activity is clean 
and clear from uh, the very high red constants of this uh, uh, nanostructured coatings. Now, at the same time, it is important to see that whether we can in, uh, decrease this uh, uh, recombination, what you call the rate of recombination, or we can suppress the rate of recombination by using a um, plasmonic decoration. If we integrate plasmonic response of noble metals onto the films of metal oxides, we can do two things at one go. We can increase this uh, light utilization capability, particularly solar light utilization capability to a very uh, higher degree going to its plasmonic response. So what we do is that the metal oxides can efficiently absorb the UV part, whereas the plasmonic uh, nanostructures which are integrated uh, in the form of nanohybrids, they can tap into of uh, this nanostructure metal Sir, have joined us again. Yes, sir, we can continue. Yeah. So, uh, so this, uh, this is clear from the UV visible spectrum that uh, uh, this. Uh, light utilization in the visible is improved going to this plasmonic response of this uh, nanostructured uh, uh, gold particles. And the band gap varies from 3.23 to 3.21. That's a negligible variation. So what you see here is that we have improved utilization of sunlight and uh, with the decoration of gold nanostructures. FECM shows clearly that uh, we have uh, gold nanoparticles decorating um, zinc oxide, the nanostructures, and the size of these gold nanoparticles increased from 34 nanometer to 46 nanometer as we increase the annealing temperature. We have used this uh, material, uh, various uh, coatings for degrading uh, pollutants, and we see that uh, uh, this uh, gold ZNO hybrid annealed at uh, 400 degrees centigrade exhibits the highest photocatalytic activity. And the origin is clear that uh, you have efficient solar utilization, solar light utilization and suppression of charge recombination. This various plasmonic nanocomposites uh, have been, we have prepared uh, by various uh, routes and atom means patterning is one such efficient route where you can uh, prepare an array of plasmonic nanocomposites. You can see that we have synthesized gold silicon core cell nanostructures, gold gender nanocomposites, so all different sort of nanocomposites using a simple route of atom beam sputtering and in which you use neutral uh, argon atoms of 1.5 kV energy. This is incident at 45 degree and the uh, sputtered uh, atoms are collected onto different substrates, which is on a rotating substrate holder. So one needs to just increase the sputtering time to have a, a increased different thickness of these films. And of course, one can control this uh, area coverage by these metallic foils on different uh, semiconducting targets or insulating targets to produce nanocomposites of uh, uh, interest. 
So we have again tested uh, numerous, I mean, uh, different uh, nanocomposites, but uh, atom wind sputtered silver PiO2 nanocomposites we have tested for, for its activity for photocatalytic activity. The FeCM shows that there are nanostructured uh, coatings, and this is on these coatings are on silicon. Of course, we have synthesized uh, these material these coatings on um, coatings on uh, glass and uh, uh, quartz and various other substrates. The idea is to keep it inexpensive, so we prefer silica glass or glass as a uh, sort of a choice, a material of choice, substrate of choice when you go on to develop coatings. But again, it depends on what sort of material, what sort of composition you look at. Uh, depending on that, one can go, go for coatings onto various metallic uh, substrates as per the requirement one can. So that's the beauty of this technique. TM clearly shows that uh, this uh, silver TiO2 nanocomposite film consists of uh, silver nanoparticles embedded in TiO2 matrix. And uh, this is again clear from this uh, uh, TM, higher, higher magnification TM and of course uh, the mappings. Um, XRD shows that they are made up of silver nanoparticles in rutile TiO2. And uh, as we increase this uh, content of silver from uh, 1%, 5%, and 10%, you can see that uh, uh, there is a variation in absorbance. And uh, the UV peak is from TiO2, whereas the visible band is due to the surface plasma resonance of uh, uh, these silver nanoparticles. And uh, we tested this for photocatalytic uh, degradation of uh, different pollutants, in this case, methylene uh, blue. And 5% loading of silver, that is TA5, leads to uh, extremely high efficiency. It can, it, uh, it can degrade all the pollutants and water in just around 20, 25 minutes. Now, the mechanism of this activity is interesting because you see, when you decorate a metal oxide with plasmonic uh, structure, uh, and again, you have a, a molecule like a pollutant, one has to consider all this. Uh, that when light is incident on such a system, what happens? So what you see here is that when light is incident uh, on the semiconductor, electrons are excited in the conduction band. So we have a photo generation of electron and holes. Holes are there in the valence band. And then this uh, pollutant, particularly dyes, can get excited. They inject electrons into the conduction band. Now you're looking at this uh, plasmonic nanostructure. Uh, they, it's a metal. So metal semiconductor, short key junction, for that we will have uh, electron scavenging action. So the electron scavenging action leads to suppression of uh, this recombination because the major chunk of these electrons are, uh, sub, are sort of uh, the sink action of silver nanoparticles for that electrons are uh, scavenged into these nanoparticles. Whereas when uh, we have solar exposure, the visible excitation or particularly the invisible excitation induces these plasmons and you have a, a, some electrons are injected into this thing. So all these processes overall, that's why one has to have optimization of uh, the decoration so that uh, the, the semiconductor uh, is not completely covered up. And that's where uh, and you have to improve the photocatalytic activity by uh, utilizing uh, more of the sunlight or efficiently utilizing sunlight going to the optimal plasmonic decoration and you want to uh, suppress this electron hole recombination with the electron scavenging action. So these are the critical, th these are the most important things one has to consider when you want to design plasmonic uh, catalyst. If it is a semiconductor, uh, if it is metal oxide semiconductor, other thing that also one has to consider that uh, this plasmonic photocatalyst, uh, you have optimal metal loading. So, uh, uh, so we have synthesized an array of metal oxides and their uh, hybrids with plasmonic nanostructures and numerous uh, two-dimensional materials. Uh, in this instance, uh, nanostructure zinc oxide, copper oxide, TiO2 with different morphologies have been synthesized and zinc oxide nanodisks, they exhibit highest photocatalytic activity. They detoxify a very high concentration of organic pollutants in just eight minutes of under the sun. And uh, this, this is one of the most cited work from the group. I mean, something around 230 odd citations so far. So th this is a promising catalyst because uh, one can use this for large scale water purification. One has to control 
on us to optimize the fraction of exposed facets. That's it. As far as zinc oxide is concerned. Now, nanostructure coatings of TiO2 copper oxide by various uh, magneton sputtering uh, exhibit superior photocatalytic and catalytic activities, and different plasmonic nanocomposites have been designed, and uh, they exhibit a very high uh, photocatalytic and catalytic activity for treatment and detoxification of water. I would uh, like to acknowledge uh, these are uh, the collaborators we are involved in only this photocatalysis and catalysis work. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, support from uh, uh, my collaborators are there. And this is the main group as I have already shown. And I thank uh, all the funding agencies, DST, uh, Nanomission for providing the facilities uh, in uh, my university, and Omen Scientist, uh, uh, Inspire, and then UGC, IUSC, so IIIT. Thank all the funding agencies for their continuous support, and uh, again my university for uh, the support in the form of some uh, in the form of FRGs grants. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful presentation. Now we take one by one question and answers. And uh, there's by the time I ask the question, uh, there I I'll ask first question from the chat box that everybody can be ready. Question is, sir, what what does y-axis scale bar in absorption curve for value more than one? Y-axis. Uh, what does why does y-axis scale bar in absorption curve show the value more than one? More than one. Us to uh, we see, we have to look at uh, uh, absorbance actually. We we'll look at uh, calculate this. Uh, this, this is uh, not one actually. This is normalized one. So we look at this. This is a normalized uh, one. So when you uh, uh, any uh, record UV visible spectroscopy, you want to look at absorbance. Absorbance depends on the concentration of molecules. In that, uh, if you are looking at a solution, uh, liquid phase. So now you can see that uh, this, uh, uh, when you vary this uh, concentration of uh, uh, this uh, with various molecules or analytes, this absorbance is a linear uh, curve. As you increase, uh, this concentration will increase. Now, uh, one has to, uh, if you are uh, comparing that within around, you can record up to around absorbance of around four. Uh, in, in this uh, various invisible spectrophotometers. Now, if you're looking at uh, that uh, in terms of uh, normalizing that it is uh, like the transmittance or absorbance, uh, then uh, yes, one has to consider that. If you look at transmittance, it is like 100% dot. But if you look at simple monitor, the uh, what you call absorption, then it can have different values. And we have to take care of that uh, uh, dilution so that we put it Win the window to be possible to be able to record them beyond six, all these things will saturate. So, you should keep it the absorbance below of absorption value below four so that you can record with it. Yes, sir. We move towards the next question from Himanshu Dadich. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So, my question is that in TIO2 thin films. Why does the 40 nanometer thin film have lowest bending gap compared to others? Yeah, actually, in any coating, what is important is uh, that uh, uh, you see, photocatalytic activity is a, a, there's a lot of contributions are there. Uh, one has to care about uh, when you have a thin film coating, what is the crystallite size? First thing one has to worry about is the crystallite size and uh, crystalline quality. So what, how, what is the fraction of amorphous or crystalline or different phases present? Second, uh, or what you call third or other, is the, what is the surface roughness of the film? Because if you have a relatively rough film, uh, you are basically, uh, even if the same amount of material is coated, you are increasing the uh, number of active sites because the area is higher now. Now, so the surface roughness comes into picture. The next thing is important is uh, what is the light utilization capability. You see, all these things are related. Whether uh, the crystallite size, defects, quality, 
roughness and its right utilization or right absorption uh, capability is going to be important. So when you grow different films, be it uh, TiO2, be it zinc oxide, one has to optimize these parameters because photocatalytic activity strongly depends on the uh, this uh, crystallite size, the defect density, all these things has to be uh, taken care of. Now, the same study, if someone does at a higher temperature, then uh, there will be change because it's a, it's a beautiful interplay of different parameters which has to be optimized. You want to develop a uh, large scale coating, particular, even in small scale, you have to respect, you have to consider that what is the defect density, what is the phase fraction, whether there is a morphous fraction, all these things, and what is the light utilization capability uh, and the quality of film, of course. These are the things which one must consider. Yes, sir. We move towards the next question from Dr. Ram Chandra. Sir, please unmute from your side, Dr. Ramchandra. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello. 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 Are you hearing, sir? Yes. Ah. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your the uh, nice presentation. Uh, I have the two questions. Last 10 years, our group from the Shivaji University working on Sir, you are not audible. You are not audible. Uh, Okay, we, we, we move towards the next question. Okay. By that by that time, we take the question from Sharad Kumar. So my question is. Take the next question from uh, Akhilesh Pandey, sir. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra, are you uh, able to listen to me? Yes. Uh, this, first of all, I would like to say that very nice uh, presentation given by you. So I want to congratulate you. Uh, second, my question is ki, while uh, uh, using the TI catalyst, photocatalytic activity of TiO2, which phase is preferred? Mm -hmm like uh, anatase, brookite, or uh, rutile, and why uh, prefer? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, um, uh, if you are looking at TiO2, yeah, what yeah. is important is the phase. Yeah, the yeah. Phase, the phase is important, and you know that uh, uh, this uh, and anatase is a better uh, as far as photocatalyst is concerned. So a major chunk of anatase is around 78% and 22% of uh, rutile is good. But uh, uh, so now uh, what we have found out through uh, systematic studies uh, in uh, one of my uh, PhD students' thesis, just Singh, uh, so that uh, uh, if one can uh, actually optimize this uh, phase fraction, so it's a uh, optimal of anatase rutile phase fraction is required. In addition, one has to care about the, the crystallite size and uh, what sort of defects are there and their concentration. So the phase fraction optimization at the major chunk, uh, typically around 75 to around 79 in that range, uh, sort of one has to optimize. 
uh, anatase to rutile and in addition one must consider that uh, the the defect uh, concentrations uh, and of course uh, what you call light utilization capability uh, which rest, uh, are, which is related and uh, in designing an efficient photocatalyst so it's not just the phase it's the phase fraction is the number of defects what sort of defects are there and its light utilization capability its surface area so one has to have a, a, a optimization uh, so that we come up with the best we have done that using various sort of uh, uh, coatings different morphologies different hybrids and that is basically uh, one of my student just pal's thesis yes sir thank you now we move towards the next question from anirudh singh uh, good afternoon sir uh, i am good afternoon sir i am anirudh singh from uh, jivaji university good afternoon and my and my, and my question is sir sir we are uh, doing doping of electrons since 1948 which yeah. is almost smaller than nano size so do we call it as nano attack or not doping of a uh, doping of electrons sir i mean doping of electrons into yes sir so we were we I mean doping is usually done uh, like you have put some atoms into another matrix so you have a crystal and you want to put some atoms another impurity foreign atoms and uh, it can be an interstitial or it can be in lattice site that is called doping and uh, if you are looking at like uh, something which can inject electrons that's a different story but sir since it is a smaller than uh, electron so do we not call it as nanotech look electron is, is an elementary particle we, we have nothing uh, like you see you have to look at uh, Uh, the atomic size, and uh, when you talk about doping, we are looking at nanomaterials which are much larger. You have to look at the dimensions. We are looking at particles where you have around five hundred thousands of atoms. Now, of course, electron is a constituent of an atom, and uh, and there are many electrons. And of course, there are variety of different type of electrons uh, in a sense, or other something called free electrons. Uh, now, what is important when you are looking at doping? we are looking at changing the host lattice or crystal crystal characteristics by adding few impurity atoms into its lattice and it is done at a very low level of doping that's why the low level of concentration and the aim is basically to introduce some energy levels inside the band gap in in the context of photocatalysis or catalysis that so that you can delay recombination so you are deliberately adding either some donor labels or acceptor labels so to so that we can use them to our advantage they have been there all the time but if you want to use doping for uh, improving photocatalytic activity one has to optimally add suitable uh, impurities or dopants uh, at at the desired concentration definitely Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Now we move towards the next question from Doctor Tanan Chaitru. Uh, hello, sir. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, thank you for very much uh, very good presentation, uh, sir. I am having uh, two questions. First question is that I have seen your presentation. Uh, just I would like to know that uh, why you are not uh, you can say going for transmission electron microscopy for the you can say characterization of the thin films. And uh, uh, we have extensive. Yeah. Are you that complete? Yeah, please, sir. Yeah. Actually, we see that. we have extensively characterized all the materials with a transmission electron microscopy and uh, uh, it, um, uh, you can see that actually uh, we have to limit uh, i have to limit within around 40 slides so you can see there are already uh, there are seven students working with four phd thesis so it's an enormous amount of work all of these are extensively characterized uh, in fact we have we go for higher level of characterization using where we uh, map elemental mapping stem had a all the sort of different analysis are done here what we see is so you what i have shown you is basically a, a concise depiction of different materials to give you a flavor of different metal oxides in use and their strategies to achieve enhanced photocatalytic and catalytic activity and sir second question is that sir I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Only one question. We move towards the next question from Mukesh Chawda. Uh, hello, sir. I'm audible. Hello. Hello, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes. 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 Yeah. 
सर आई एम क्यूरियस टू नो दैट व्हाट इज द एक्चुअली रीजन बिहाइंड द चेंज इन पोटालिटिक एक्टिविटी विद द मॉर्फोलॉजी ऑफ द मटेरियल्स आई मीन इज देयर एनी फिजिकल और केमिकल फिनोमिना व्हिच कैन बी रिलेटेड टू इट यस डेफिनेटली सो इफ यू लुक एट i i will take you to uh, uh, this uh, zinc oxide work which we have yeah. discussed then there, we are talking at different morphologies yeah. so we have the nano particles we have spindles we have nano sheets and we have uh, nano disks and uh, we have flowers made wow. up of nano uh, uh, sheets now how, how does this uh, uh, comes we have to look at uh, uh, in totality as well as we have to look at the constituents uh, of these nano structures when you have we tell that i have a flower i have a flower like morphology you have to look at the flowers are made up of petals mm. and then petals are made up of in this case are they are made up of nano particles so now if you look at uh, uh, optimizing the photocatalytic or catalytic activity uh, what is required is uh, to optimize uh, or to sort of control the crystallite size first and control their orientation attachment or give a condition where they can grow into nano sheets beautifully and then self assembly to a structure uh, of which is three dimensional in case of flower and uh, in that we see that flowers are not the best as far as photocatalytic activity is concerned so what is required is that you need to have very uh, strong photocatalytic activity active facets if you are looking at a crystal it's the facet which is going to be have a say now what is the crystallite size how may, what sort of defects are there and if if a material is made up of such and then definitely you will emerge with a very strong unusually strong photocatalyst and catalyst that's the case in several of the studies which have shown now in that context morphology what are the advantages of uh, having uh, such a, a different sort of morphology what we want to achieve is we want to improve the uh, number of active sites where pollutant molecules can adsorb so adsorption is a process which um, basically uh, which has to be considered when you design materials now you want to efficiently adsorb then you need to have a high surface area for that material now again uh, as i have already shown you in various materials we work on array of materials metal oxides 2d materials hybrids sulfides and now some what you call perovskites and all the cases are different and where you have see that it's not just the crystallite size it's not just the light utilization capability one has to uh, sort of improve the charge separation as well so it's an interplay and uh, that's uh, that's where it's bit intricate and it bit involved that one has to have uh, you have to give a condition so the surface area is high that is in fact one of the reasons where 2d materials come into picture they have reasonably high surface area to facilitate adsorption but at the same time we see that not all 2d materials are good photocatalysts they cannot match even zinc oxide push to this level why because that's where one has to sort of come up with the best uh, a sort of uh, uh, tunable tunable uh, properties or tunable parameters so that we can design the best out of an inexpensive material because we are looking at large scale purification driven by the sunlight so cost has also to be taken into consideration yes thank you sir now if you permit we can take one more question we, we take the next question from akilesh pandey no i have uh, asked uh, question thank you uh, next uh, we take the next question last question of this session from rahul duvedi hello 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 good morning sir so my question is how can uh, nanotechnology deal with uh, the quantum phenomena and saturation of the moore's law no it's not clearly audible this we deal with sir uh, the saturation of the moore's law so we have limitations uh, in nanotechnology as well because quantum phenomena takes place so so how can nanotechnology deal with it actually i didn't get saturation of uh, 
सर सैचुरेशन ऑफ द मोर्स लॉ लाइक हाउ मेनी ट्रांजिस्टर्स कैन एग्जिस्ट ऑन अ चिप अच्छा सो दैट्स कॉल्ड दैट इज अ सबकॉल नी कॉल्ड मिनिचराइजेशन व्हाट डू यू सी दैट इयरलीयर इट इज टू बी सब माइक्रोन थिंग्स नो व्हाट हाउ नैनो साइंस हेल्प्स हियर इज दैट we want to have very everything compact we have to have everything compact on a very small so that you have all capabilities or functionalities like you this day you use smartphones with all the sort of features now you want to pack materials uh, into very small size and you want to make, uh, pack a lot of these devices then definitely you have to reduce the components what i mean is that if you have uh, you have talk about a device then what are the components there there will be some metal contacts now we some semiconducting materials which will do the job which is the heart of the metal heart of the device and some insulating layers now this interfacial quality or what is particular the thickness of this layers has to reduce and it has reduced into very some very uh, sort of a small scale so less than 10 nanometer so that you have nano electronic effects now so they are challenging so now you, earlier the devices are bigger now you want to push this boundary smaller so you have to come up with uh, technology or what you call fabrication processes where you can pack very small components uh, small materials uh, and uh, con- given them contacts and so that we have something unusual something very good of uh, use that's why nano electronic devices are and where we have single electron tunneling all sort of fascinating uh, physics ahead and that is very exciting in fact it is uh, this excitement uh, which is actually motivating lot of uh, Uh, uh interest and applications in the area of nano electronics thank you so much sir for answering all these questions now we move ahead to the end of this session and before that i would like to invite ms phageshri udeshi from a phd scholar in our department of physics saurashtra university to present a vote of thanks to our today's speaker welcome uh, phageshri Good morning, one and all present here. It gives an immense pleasure to deliver a vote of thanks for this event to all the dignitaries assembled here, as it is truly stated that no duty is more important than that of returning thanks. I, Bhagyashree Udeshi, on behalf of Department of Physics, Saurashtra University, Department of Science and Technology, Government of Gujarat, DST, Guj Cost, and Essence Tech. extend a very heartly word of thanks to dr satyabrata mohpatra sir for gracing talk and sharing with us your findings and opinions today thank you sir for enlightening us about dye degradation textured nanofilm using various sputtering techniques and photocatalytic activities in some of those films i would also like to thank our honorable vice chancellor dr nitin pethani sir pro vice chancellor dr vijay deshani sir Dean Faculty of Science Dr Mehul Rupani sir head of the department of physics professor Hiren Joshi sir and Mehir Joshi sir professor Nikesh Shah sir Dr Narottam Shah sir advisor Guj Cost and Dr Piyush Solanki sir for organizing such an informative event thank you all once again we thank you sir for accepting our invitation and delivering such a wonderful talk thank you all thank you once again and have a good day tomorrow we will meet at the same time in the same platform thank you all thank you sir